Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this final session where we have uh, brought together a distinguished panel to, con help, uh, to help conclude uh, this conference uh, between wider Brookings and the African Development Bank. One of the key objectives of these conferences is that we have a very sincere wish to bring people together, to serve as a platform where views, research insights, new trends, old insights can meet and can help further thoughts and research ideas about the future. As a very young researcher working in a number of southern African countries, I had a deep wish of sort of speaking with these people who have deep insights, and this is really one of the things that we are pursuing with these conferences, bringing people together across age groups, across perspectives, to serve as a real platform. I'm therefore pleased to say that we have this afternoon a great panel who will engage in a conversation with all of us, share their insights, and try to make sort of points about what we have learned, what we don't know, and also maybe some hints as to what might be the core elements of the future research agenda. So let me just very quickly introduce the panel, and then we will take off. Professor Ernest Arayiti, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Chair of the wider board. Dr. Fuad Kasim, an old combatant from South Africa, advisor to the Minister of Finance from South Africa, Professor Carol Newman, one of the rising stars, collaborator with John Rand and myself in quite a number of works in Vietnam and Mozambique, Dr. John Page, former senior staff member of the World Bank, senior research staff for Brookings, an external project director wider, and one of my rare dance partners at the ARC dance floors, <laughs> Professor Daniel Roderick, international leading academic, I think I don't need to say more. Witness the just appointed research director of the most successful economic network in Africa, the African Economic Research Consortium. John Sutton, leading international academic, and what you said this morning in your keynote is still swearing around my head, and I'm thinking about broken wheels. <laughs> and Samuel Wang, old Tanzania colleague, one of the African lions, I guess. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And if I may ask maybe Ernest to start out by just saying a very few words about some of your observations. And then if any of the, in the remaining panel, we will take it in the alphabetical order. Maybe just one comment, two comments. Tell us what you want to say, but you are allowed to be extremely brief because what we really want to do <laughs> is that we want to have a conversation going here. Um, my administrative boss, he told me later on that I'm supposed to act like a moderator. Uh, we earlier on this year had a moderator called Hillary. She was much more pretty than I am, but I am going to try to see whether I can help motivate the discussion. Feel free to get your questions ready. And it is perfectly fine in this audience to be very frank. This is about learning. This is about sharing knowledge. Let's get going on that, and let's conclude our conference in a really nice way. So, Ernest. Uh, thank you very much, Finn, for inviting me to be on this panel. Indeed, uh, having missed yesterday's uh, discussions, I probably am not well qualified to be talking about what we've learned here over the past two days. But I'm very happy to see that the Learning to Compete uh, project has come this far. Uh, three years ago, John Page and I were still uh, working on how to structure it and uh, what countries to look at and uh, which issues to focus on. So I'm very happy to see how far it's come. I'm very happy to see that there are projects uh, going on in several countries, and uh, these projects seem to show us that learning uh, does occur under some circumstances, and we are probing further to find those circumstances. I listened to the 
discussions on Vietnam and the discussions on uh, Ethiopia. Uh, this morning I listened to John Sutton, uh, and uh, as Finn said, posed the issue of uh, whether we needed to have uh, an approach that would fit every country, or each country had to explore for itself what works best for it. Uh, he did talk about uh, mending uh, broken wheels or mending broken wheels. Uh, that really sits for, to be uh, the right place in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, we need to focus on industrialization by way of uh, mending broken wheels. But what happens if there's no wheel to be uh, fixed? What happens if we have a country that, for as a result of its structure, has never really had any uh, cart with wheels, and so the, are, the, the wheels are broken. How do you start in that kind of a situation? We need to begin a conversation on how to industrialize Africa. And there's no doubt in my mind that that industrialization is the way to go, and many people have given reasons for that. I run a university. Uh, luckily, we don't do much engineering. But in our sister universities, uh, they have focused on engineering for more than 40 years. And yet I see today in Ghana, and also in many African countries, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, unemployed. Who would have thought 10 years ago that this would be happening in Africa? Chemical engineers, unemployed. And uh, people blame the universities pro for producing people who are unemployable. How do you create a system in, an, in, the, in the fast great African economy where you, you put money, public money into universities to produce chemical engineers, they can't find jobs for them. You can't find jobs for them because there's no manufacturing taking place. Your civil engineers, your architects are unemployed because there's no construction taking place. These are the things that make it necessary for every African economy to begin to focus on why should there be a link between the human capital we're generating and the way the economy functions. In your average African economy, that discussion takes place in separate corridors, and that's what for, for nothing at all, I've learned that so long as you don't plan properly how to develop manufacturing, how to link manufacturing to other sectors of the economy, including education, it's a waste of time. African countries spend so much money on education at different levels, and yet can't make good use of these, the human capital generated in the right places. So when I hear about the oil industry, new oil industry in Ghana or in Tanzania, lacking petroleum engineers, but these are countries that have been producing petroleum engineers for many, many years, and they know how to do it. So how come they haven't produced the right type of petroleum engineers? I do hope that in the discussions, we will be able to find answers to some of these uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ernest. Fuad? Uh, thank you, Fun, and thank you for inviting me, and uh, congratulations to WIDER for getting this conference going. Uh, I want to uh, start with uh, a, a comment on John, Professor John Sutton's paper, uh, which I think was an ex extremely elegant paper and, and, and well presented. Uh, I think the notion of an enterprise map is, is quite uh, an interesting way of dealing with the problem, and I, and I agree with you, uh, the, Ernst, that, uh, that uh, the broken wheels approach does certainly make sense because it's a very pragmatic approach and a non kind of ideological approach. But I want to nudge uh, uh, Professor John Sutton to go a step further and embark on a state uh, map because that will also enable us to understand how the state works. Uh, because that is, that is uh, often uh, uh, misunderstood in, in, in a lot of the literature. Now, the, the role of government uh, failure is often my second, and this brings me to my second point. Uh, the role of government failure is often overplayed. Uh, because the success of, uh, of it depends on state capability. Uh, the, better the, scape, the, the better the state capability is, uh, the more likely is industrial policy to achieve its intended objectives. And a realistic assessment of 
industrial policy and how ambitious you want it to be needs to address the question of state capability, which I think features very much in the East Asian context. Uh, so what is uh, state capability? It's the capability of bureaucrats, the functioning of institutions, and how effectively these institutions work. My third point is that, and which I'm pleased uh, this uh, conference did not uh, miss out on, is the whole question of what does political economy mean? Because if you look at industrial policy, it is so all encompass encompassing that the biggest political political economy constraint is the lack of departmental coordination in government. And this is what I mean when I say understanding how the state works. Uh, because in the industrial policy has to do with alignment with various other government departments. Now, you, in other words, it's hard to achieve success in one without the other. So, Policymakers need to be aware that industrial policy can work and industrial policy can fail to. And, you know, one has to adopt a, a, uh, a, a pragmatic approach to this. The other important thing that I think uh, I want to comment on is, is that we have to change the way economists, international institutions, and governments think about industrial policy because sometimes we tend to think of it simply as a technocratic uh, part of, 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 of government policy. And to do so, we have to understand politics, which I think this conference did address, particularly uh, in one of the parallels, parallel sessions today, that we have to understand politics, or more appropriately, the political economy of uh, industrial policy. And that means the role of institutions, uh, in, in that way, I think this may generate a more informed uh, policy outcome. Uh, the final comment is that if, if one is looking at uh, industrial policy, I think we have to be aware that industrial policy can work, but equally it can also not work. So, and, and the difference really lies in the objectives and the functioning of institutions. Implementing the policies, the institutions implementing the policies, and those are determined very much by the political system. So we can't divorce industrial policy from the politics of a country, the specific institutional context. I think I'll leave it at there. Thank you, Fuad. Thank you. Carol? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Finn. Um, so my observations and, and the, the points I would like to make are based on the work that I've been doing with the Learning to Compete project and with the various country teams, and also based on my observations of the work that's been carried out over the last two days. So we've seen a variety of papers, a variety of micro studies that provide us with an evidence base now for thinking about enterprise policy, for thinking about industrial policy, um, and for thinking about you know, how the opportunities that Africa um, have in the coming years and how these can be exploited. I want to identify two opportunities, um, both of which have been touched upon and mentioned um, in the keynotes um, speech yesterday. Um, the first relates to the, the decline in the traditional sectors um, in Asia and the potential for um, Africa to exploit these opportunities. Um, and I think that this can be done through there will be competition for this investment, and that's the first point, is that there will be competition for this investment, and how um, this investment is realized in Africa will depend on private sector development, um, linking in with what uh, John Sutton was talking about this morning, and the development of a mid-sized manufacturing sector um, is very important here, but also in attracting foreign direct investment. Um, and one thing that we've learned from the Learning to Compete project is that um, foreign direct investment in many African nations is not in any way linked in with the domestic, domestic economy, provides employment but does not link in with private enterprise. So um, finding ways in which to create a dynamic private sector that can link in with that supply chain would be crucial in that. 
The second key opportunity and another core theme of the Learning to Compete project has been in relation to exporting and understanding learning by exporting. Um, and what lots of the studies that we have seen presented over the last two days have shown is that it's the productive firms who export. We've also seen um, born, the born global phenomenon with um, you know, firms being created just to serve the export market. Um, one, thing, one point that was made um, very briefly in yesterday's keynote was about intra-Africa trade. And in fact, intra-Africa trade accounts for a very small small proportion of trade in Africa. This is a, the fastest growing population in the world, growing incomes, this is a huge market that can be exploited. So I think that one potential opportunity here is to help private domestic firms to link in with local African markets um, and to trade and to start to trade there. Learning takes time and that learning process will evolve over time. And here it's about understanding the capabilities as, as, as John Sutton mentioned this morning. Um, it's about um, perhaps working with export promotion agents it's about thinking about clusters and agglomeration and all of these factors that we are looking at in the Learning to Compete project. And if I may, my very last point is that I don't think um, we can forget about fundamentals. One shocking thing we've learned from all of the scoping papers that have been presented over the last two days um, is that one of the main constraints to business in Africa um, is infrastructure, and in particular power. And again, this is something that was mentioned in the keynote yesterday, and um, it's, it's, it's a fix that could be made and needs to be made. Investment in power, power outages are one of the biggest constraints to, to business in Africa. So they're the three points that, that I would like to make. Thank you, Carol. John Page? Let me use Governor Ndulu's Afro-optimism to um, make a point which emerges both from the work that we've been doing but also from the discussions we've had uh, over the past two days. I truly believe, as he does, that we will see in the 21st century a group of African leopards. I do not believe that the African leopards will look like the Asian tigers. I think for a number of reasons, uh, the abundance of natural resources, the emerging new discoveries and heretofore non-resource rich economies, um, the nature of the global economy, and perhaps the smaller window of opportunity to enter uh, international markets and trade and tasks, what we'll see is a successful African economy with a robust manufacturing sector, but perhaps not a dominant mass manufacturing sector some natural resources, and very importantly, I think, some industries without smokestacks. Agro-processing, uh, even if you like industrialized agriculture, tourism, which is enormously important and in which the continent has a major um, natural resource-based competitive advantage. I always think of it in terms of, of Dorothy, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. You don't have that very often anywhere. Um, and so I think in thinking about where do we go from here, one of the things I would urge both African governments and aid agencies to begin thinking about is some of the challenges of managing such a diversified economy. Because we tend to put things in boxes. All right, over here we have natural resource rich economies and we worry about uh, public expenditure and we worry about uh, transparency and the management of the resource. Over here we have a coastal economy and we worry about industrial policy and somewhere in the landlocked space in the center of the continent we worry about an economy that may have no natural advantage in doing either of them. I think what we need to do is get away from that a bit and think about where the kinds of characteristics, capabilities if you will, uh, are similar across these sorts of activities. And then urging, uh, someone asked Danny today, do we know anything about whether tradable services have the same characteristics as um, manufacturing in terms of his findings on the more rapid productivity and constrained productivity convergence? The answer is probably not because we simply don't have the data. So there's a big area, I think, of research there, both in terms of learning and in terms of what the characteristics of these activities are. And the second area is then in thinking about how you manage such an economic transition in a more diversified type of world, getting away from the one economy types of policies and getting back to the recognition that yes, you need basic, you need the basics, right, the fundamentals have to be there. But beyond the fundamentals, I think you then need to get into a conversation with the principles. And that brings us to the topic that we covered on business government relations, where I think we still have a long way to go in understanding what works and what doesn't in the African context in terms of business government relations, coordination, and understanding what the true constraints are to development in such a diversified production space. Okay, thank you, John. Professor Roderick? Uh, John and I didn't coordinate beforehand, but he's actually 
talked much better than, than I could have about my, the, the first two things that I was going to say. So I just want to sort of repeat those and not, uh, I mean, not repeat, just say that I, I very much second uh, the, the two things. One is I don't think African countries are going to replicate anything like the industrialization experience that Asian countries had, or for that matter, the European countries had uh, in, in, in an earlier period. I think uh, we're, we're moving into a world where um, you'd be lucky if you can get you know, 12, 13 percent of your employment into manufacturing, let alone 30, 40 percent, as, as some countries have achieved in the past. So that's going to be a very different kind of world. Um, and, and I think in, in many ways, actually, manufacturing is taking on the, the characteristics of uh, natural resources when you think about how capital intensive and skill intensive uh, some of the um, uh, export oriented manufacturing that if you wanted to get you know, plugged into uh, global supply chains, uh, in terms of its, its, their ability to absorb domestic employment, actually you know, these kinds of activities often do not necessarily look all that different from, um, uh, from some resource enclaves. Uh, so uh, the implication of that is, is that, that the kind of very rapid growth that we saw in, in Asia may very well have turned out, to, turned out to have been a historical aberration, something that we're never going to see again. And I think, you know, when we talk about um, African leopards, I mean, maybe we want to re significantly low, lower what our reasonable expectations uh, are about how much growth uh, um, can, can be experienced without the kind of industrialization that, that Asia uh, went through. Um, again, the point about uh, state business relations, I think the, the thing to, to, to note is that, that even if in some sense, an implication of what I just said is that you don't need the, the same kind of state business framework for industrial policy nearly as much because in some sense industrialization isn't going to get you nearly as far as, as it did in, in East Asia. You still need that state business relations for a whole wide set of issues that across, cut across everything in economic policy, where it's, where it's labor policy, it's education policy, fiscal policy. So getting into that frame of mind in terms of establishing these, those collaborative uh, state business uh, institutions seem to be very important. Finally, I would just emphasize something that I, I think may have been talked about in, 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 in some uh, sessions, um, but I, I, I was in other sessions. So the, the micro-macro link, particularly in terms of the relationship between industrial policy and the exchange rate. I think it's important to understand, at least I think, uh, is the case that industrial policy and exchange rate policy are, are basically substitutes at some level. That that you know the the less you can use the exchange rate to gain give your modern industries, your trade, tradable industries, a competitiveness edge, the more you have to rely on industrial policy. So the more your exchange rate is 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 hostage to natural resource prices or or, or, or foreign aid inflows, the greater then the, becomes the premium on industrial policy, which is in fact you know for all the reasons we discussed so hard to, to, to do. On the other hand, the more you can target the exchange rate. On, on competitiveness, the less you need uh, industrial policy. Thank you. Witness? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so for me, I think, yeah, so the starting point for me is that, uh, yes, I think based on what we have heard in this uh, uh, conference, industrial policy does have a role to play in Africa. But, but perhaps we have to conceptualize it differently from the way the orthodox way of looking at it, which is uh, what Professor Rodrigues is just uh, talking about now. Uh, obviously, the, the, appeal, the appeal of industrial of manufacturing uh, or industrialization in Africa is that uh, the possibility of having, having mass mass job creation because of mass production. But again, I, I don't quite I fully agree with the previous speakers in that I don't quite see that happening anytime soon in Africa because uh, I think this is a very contested space. South Asia, uh, I think uh, they have probably better proximity to major industrial powers. So clearly, for me. It's probably we have to take a slightly different uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, form. So one thing that I also sort of uh, think is interesting or important to note is that uh, uh, research, recent research or studies have shown that uh, actually if you look at value added, because one of the appeals of, of uh, industrialization is that uh, it's, of course, it's high value added production, so then that allows for raising of incomes uh, of the workers. But, but actually if you look at recent studies, for example, there's an inverted U, well, there's a U shape where the lowest value added is on production, the actual physical production. But actually, the pre-production stage and the post-production stage does have higher value added. So essentially, those who will partake in the pre-production stage, which is R&D, logistics, uh, pre-production logistics, they accumulate most of the value added. 
and, and those who do the post-production uh, logistics and marketing and things like that, they also get the most valuated. Those who actually undertake the physical production, they get the least share of the pie. And, and I, I think a good example is, of course, what has been happening with Apple, for example. Uh, most of the value added goes to, to Apple, which is in the, in the U.S., but actually probably the least of amount goes to, to, to China, which is doing the, the assembly. So I think that's something that is interesting. Uh, so in terms of where we go from here, I think, um, for me, I think, uh, yes, there's a need, uh, obviously, I think it has been talked about, that uh, it's a strong need for, for partnerships uh, between uh, industry and, 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 and government. But obviously, it's sort of risky in terms of capture. There's always a possibility for capture there. Uh, but one thing that also sort of struck me in terms of the sessions I attended, especially the scoping papers, was that uh, in Africa, if you look at the trends towards industrialization for the last five decades, there's a clear sort of uh, uh, trend appearing that there's no, the kind of policies that are being pushed there, they lack uh, sort of, uh, uh, if you want, a social appeal. So essentially, each, each government that comes to power, they will actually completely change the, the policies, and they, they have a completely different mix of policies, which I think probably partly explains the sort of the failure of uh, takeoff in Africa, that there's, there's never been sort of um, any uh, desire to carry on what has been working and, what, and drop what has not been working, but actually it's more like a war of changes whenever a new government comes in, they have a different ideology and they try to pick it up from there. So, so I, think, I think that's something that uh, probably going forward, uh, from a policy point of view, I think uh, having a more socially uh, acceptable sort of uh, economic policies or economic plans, I think is quite important for continuity purposes. Um, then the other thing that also uh, I think is important is that um, uh, probably there's need for further work uh, to looking at uh, country competitive or competitive uh, uh, advantage areas and the precedent conditions that are required to realize those. And of course, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that do we really want to be bound by comparative advantage or can we actually buy comparative advantage and at what cost? I think those are some of the issues that uh, one might want to look at. And, and, and finally, for me, I think uh, uh, given what we've just talked about earlier in terms of the unlikeliness of Africa being the mass producer, so I, I think there's probably room for industrial policy in terms of uh, helping uh, uh, producers target niche areas. So I think that's an area that probably needs to be explored a bit further. Thanks a lot. John, in 1978, I came to Swaziland as a young associate expert. I had a boss, a supervisor. His name was John Menz. He sort of used to talk about missing links. And then occasionally he would sort of look up in the air and say, what does one do when the chain is missing? Could you relate that to your sort of broken wheels? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I'm not going to rise to that base. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do what I usually do. I'll just tell you a story. <laughs> I was in Azerbaijan nearly 10 years ago, discussing all these things and being asked all these questions. And you tell the guys in Azerbaijan, well, they do it this way in Germany, and their faces go blank. And you say they do this in America, and their faces go blank. And then you say they do this in Turkey, and their faces light up. They speak Turkish, almost. This is a relevant point of comparison. Anything the Turks can do, we can do that. <laughs> what really struck me with the international media is how they all latch on to intellectual fashions did you ever read a good story about Africa three years ago? Then about two years ago, they suddenly realized that there had been all these countries growing so fast, and within six months, all the Africa stories were positive. Now when I sit and overhear conversations about this subject, what strikes me is the divergence of views. Half the guys are talking sub-Saharan Africa up, and the other half are saying, oh, no, it'll stumble, this won't work. Well, let me give you my eternal optimist scenario. I think it has to do with emulation and relevant comparisons. I think we underestimate the power of gossip in the international business community. The MNCs go where their fellow uh, CEOs tell them, we've had a good experience here. I've seen it happen all over the place, from Hungary onwards. Well. 
happens with countries too. And I think my optimistic scenario runs like this. We've had half a dozen countries that have performed in a way over the past 10 years that has surprised people. And they don't, haven't quite caught up with it or haven't quite figured out whether they think this is real or whether it'll continue. I think over the next five years, we'll probably see two or three of those countries forging ahead even further. And if we do that, then it'll light a fire because people will look over their borders and say, look, if those guys can do it, we can do it. And they won't copy them. I'm echoing John and uh, I'm echoing Danny. Development in Sub-Saharan Africa won't look like Asia. And it won't look like Europe. It'll be its own thing. And development in different Sub-Saharan countries will look different. But there will be relevant lessons. You can look over the border and say, well, if those guys could fix the wheel, then we could fix that one too. Is it worth fixing in our context? They'll pick the wheels to fix. They'll do their own thing. But there'll be relevant points of comparison. And that is what Sub-Saharan Africa has lacked for decades. And now, those exemplars are beginning to appear, and that's good news. Thank you, John. Sam? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Finn. Uh, to me, the two days um, uh, have really emphasized the point about learning to compete. It's essentially about accumulation of capabilities. In a continuous manner, just as you don't interrupt your education, uh, stop, go home, come back after two years, stop, go home, accumulation of capabilities on a continuous manner. Now, the experience of uh, Africa, uh, the most important element I picked up here is the way we interrupted accumulation of capabilities. We started with a much state involvement, then it messed up and we were told, stop, state out. So it was really cut off from development, leave it to the market and the private sector. After several years, a decade or so, we discovered the market and private sector do not operate alone. They must operate with the private public sector. So interruption of those capabilities, a situation we saw in Asia where countries learned over time through capability accumulation from import substitution to competition to export orientation in a way where capabilities were being accumulated continuously. So this interruption of capability building uh, is a lesson which in Africa we should really learn how to avoid it and create continuity in cap capability accumulation over time. And related to this is state capabilities, uh, whereby right now having broken the role of the state for quite a decade, and now we are coming back to learn how the state operates in a market economy, uh, how to make markets function, how the state can make markets develop, how the state can facilitate private sector development to develop. Now that delicate balance is what we need to learn. Not many African countries know how to handle that delicate balance because of the big interruption which we had uh, over a period of time. So if it's one point I would emphasize is uh, accumulation of capabilities uh, by the state, uh, by the industrialists, by those operating in enterprises on a continuous basis are not interrupted, rather built on what has already been accumulated. Thank you. Okay, so development is a cumulative process of capital, physical, human, institutions. I guess I buy that one. So now is your chance for asking questions. Uh, I would request that you try to be very concise because while we do have actually 45 minutes for this discussion, try to be precise, state your questions, and if it's directed at one specific member of the panel, please do say that or otherwise state that it's for the panel in general to comment on. So I will, I started over there last time, now I'll start over here and then I will move that way. So we will start here uh, on the left side, I guess that's and then, um, let me see. So, anybody who wants to take off? Okay, Professor Yeri. 
Yeah, I'm Sajal Lahiri from Southern Illinois University. Now, we talked about the political economy and the sustainability of the process of growth. Uh, now, we have seen that in some countries, uh, the reforms have stalled, like India, my, the country I originally come from. And that's because people say that the growth has not been inclusive. Uh, the inequality has raised inequality. And uh, uh, so I think for African country, we talk about industrialization and uh, uh, growth and all that. But uh, to sustain that one, you need to have the political support. Uh, and of course, uh, Danny Rodriguez, the, uh, in the picture, the diagram he drew, at the top of it was the society. So if the society accepts it or not. And that's uh, kind of a going one step beyond the politicians and the business community. And that's something I've uh, not heard much in this conference so far. Okay. Behind? Yeah, Peter. Thank you very much. I think I've enjoyed the conference so far. Um, I have two questions, and I think to all the panel. The economic partnership agreement that African countries have signed, how do you think it will help address the challenges of African industries? Uh, because there's been the uh, skepticism that it might hurt African industries, whereas others say it would rather promote African exports. To what extent do you think it is a way forward in, in terms of addressing African industrialization. Then the second one, which we all know, is the bane of African industries, the influx of cheap products from China. Uh, many African industries have collapsed as a result of trade liberalization and the influx of cheap products from China. Um, as a way forward, how do you suggest we deal with this challenge? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. I've also enjoyed the conference. Um, I think I have one comment and two questions. Uh, so far in this conference, the issue of uh, gender has not come out very well. And uh, uh, I want to congratulate Professor Carol Newman for having the opportunity to be on the, on the panel. Uh, and I think that is the problem in Africa also. Uh, because whilst we have about 50% of the population being women, uh, we found out that almost 70% or so of all micro small enterprises are run by women. And yet we don't have clear policies to help them. So if you see, I was looking at the enterprise map for Ghana and the kind of work that uh, Professor Statin shows you hardly find any women running those uh, medium-sized large enterprises. And uh, we need a kind of industrialization that will focus on the comparative advantage where we have many, many jobs are being created in the micro small enterprises. And I think uh, I need a, a bit of discussion on that. The other question is, uh, are we very sure that the African governments are fully committed to industrial industrialization? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, then the other issue is how do we finance industrialization in Africa, given the low domestic resource mobilization in, in those countries? Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. One just, just in front there. Yeah. Um, my name is Chukwu Mago. And I have uh, three issues that uh, I'm worried about from the comments from the panel. Number one on the, is on the matter of institutions and um, industrialization. Um, and uh, one, one, what we heard was that uh, institutions and industrial policies are very closely linked. And I'm worried, say, in most African countries, institutions are not the be in their best of shapes. So, what comment will you have about how best to pro proceed on ensuring that institutions, particularly public institutions, are well positioned to be able to help, help industrial policy? My second challenge is on the changing global env environment. 
which we have seen a whole lot, and it's related to the question by Peter on EPA. There is a whole lot of, you can't do this anymore, you can't do that anymore, you can't do this anymore. And some of us who face government find them spending a lot of resources just trying to understand and implement most of these international protocols. What do you, how can you help government agencies to uh, overcome some of this you can do? My final is on education, um, which uh, Professor Areti also raised. There is this, Africa seems to have invested so much in education, but not reaping from it. And I was trying to listen to see if you have uh, a suggestion about what an average policymaker could do about it. Okay, then we take one last question up here in the front. Um, Tony? Um, Tony Addison from uh, WIDA. The question for the uh, panel to reflect on is um, what information, both qualitative and quantitative, do we really need as researchers to better understand the policy questions that Africa faces? And what information, qualitative and quantitative, do governments need to enact the policies that we want to see? Or do we, in fact, have enough information and data? OK, thank you, Tony. WIDA has never really been involved in primary data collection as such. So that is something that actually interests me quite a bit. But can I ask the panel to react? You don't have to react, uh, each one of you. But uh, I'll start with Ernest. you have any reaction? There are a couple of things that uh, came up which I thought uh, I should address and leave some of the others for the others to t take care of. There was a question from Charles about how do you finance industrialization, which I thought uh, is one that we haven't paid enough attention to uh, in all the discussions everywhere about industrialization in Africa. Uh, I, I believe you are fully aware of the situation where most financing uh, in Africa is of a short-term nature. Uh, when African governments began their first attempts at uh, industrializing in the 60s, they accompanied these uh, efforts with uh, development banks. And uh, we are fully aware of how miserably they failed uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s and make us go away from uh, the whole idea of development banking. Today, the kind of institutions that we established to provide term finance for industries have not performed as expected. There are very few uh, financial market or capital markets that work effectively to finance uh, long-term uh, uh, activity. And even when you move to the small enterprises, it becomes even more difficult. For me, the issue is uh, can we bring back uh, development banking uh, in a way well structured to take care of the financing needs of uh, small and medium enterprises, as well as firms that are seeking to grow much larger? How do you structure a development bank uh, in such a manner uh, that it has not become the uh, tool for the state to siphon uh, capital from the markets. How do you structure a development bank in such a manner that it, it has all the information that is required to make effective lending decisions? You know, it's something that can be done, but we haven't paid enough attention to that in the literature. Uh, we simply assume that with the death of these banks in the 80s, uh, there was no way you could deal with that issue. We thought the capital markets working well should be able to deal with the issue we know from 20 years of experience that's not going to happen. So is there space or uh, scope for doing development banking in Africa in a manner that supports effectively uh, industrialization? That's, I, I believe there is, and I'm working on that. The um, uh, question was about whether uh, there's room for education. Yes, indeed, we need to uh, realign the kind of education we're doing at different levels in Africa to provide the right human capital for structural transformation. Uh, universities have to modernize, the universities have to change their curricula 
to suit the new needs of uh, growing, fast growing economies. Uh, but governments have to be fully aware of uh, what their commitments should be. Uh, changing drug transformation requires research, more and more research. There's throughout Africa hardly any country where you can look at a university and say it is a research university, not even in South Africa. You know, so how are African governments positioning themselves to focus on research, provide the kind of capital needed to do good research that will support structural transformation? That's the kind of thing, that, and I believe there are examples all over the world that we can look at to push this particular agenda. Thank you. Okay, Danny, you wanted to react? You took notes? Well, you're, 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 you're forcing me. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> I have a chance now. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's partly related to the question about, you know, development banking. And, I'm, I'm, and, and sometimes I think that, that um, we, um, uh, we over-obsess about uh, finance as a constraint. Um, and, and I think clearly finance is a constraint to, to small enterprises. Um, to the, among the small and medium enterprises, certainly at the very at the small end, uh, so f so for them clearly finance is, is a constraint. Um, I wonder how much of a constraint finance uh, really is for uh, for for medium enterprises um, and and the larger enterprises. And 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 this takes us to to a bigger question as to whether if you're interested in. Uh, industrial restructuring and industrialization, to what extent can you actually hope that your small enterprises will actually grow up to be your, your medium industry, ultimately your large industry, uh, whereas uh, as opposed to whether those small enterprises will always remain your small enterprises. And I think there's, a, there's a, sometimes a risk that by focusing too much at the so small end of the um, uh, enterprise distribution, uh, you know the, the policies you, you 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 pursue end up being more or less more like social policy rather than industrial policy in the sense that that you really you know you are aiding and you are uh, assisting uh, a lot of small scale producers uh, but it's not quite clear how how much you're you're really helping um, lay the basis for uh, industrial diversification and growing if if, if I understood what what uh, John Sutton was saying this morning and I think it's a very important point that that really the base for what will be your your you know your your the the spearheading uh, firms uh, they're going to be sort of the, the medium uh, sized firms uh, 50 employees or more, um, and then the question you want to ask is, is why are they staying small, and, or, and A, and B, why aren't there more of them? Okay, so small is not always beautiful. Yeah. Um, John? Yeah, I'd like to elaborate on that, because um, this is certainly not something that's just discussed in an African context. I find that wherever I open my mouth and say something about firms or policies anywhere in the world, I run into this great big misconception, which flies in the face of the facts. Everyone seems to think that uh, there are all these small firms, and the small firms are really important because they grow into the big firms, and all your big firms come out of those small firms. And you really need to remember two big facts, which emerged from Birch's study 30 years ago in the United States, where he traced all the new firms created, these tens of thousands of firms. And the fraction of them that ever became big firms was minuscule, you know, like a small fraction of 1%. And was there anything that those firms had in common? Yeah. Everyone thought they'd be Silicon Valley high-tech firms. You know, this was starting in the 70s, but they weren't. Those Silicon Valley guys were there, but they were a minority. Health and leisure centers, number one. Why? Because that was a new sub-market. You ever see an American jogging in the 1960s? Do you ever see an American not jogging in the 1980s? <laughs> Health and leisure centers. In other words, the small firms that become great big firms are doing so because they're not typical small firms. They're in a niche, a particular sub-market. They're doing some stuff which is new. The market's going to grow, the sub-market. That business is going to grow, and they'll be carried forward on the wave because they were one of the five people that got in first, and maybe the other four failed, and maybe they weren't the first one. But it's the market that carries them up. So 
you have to look very carefully at your, your group of small firms. Most of them are three men jobs and they're going to always stay that because that's what they're designed to be. Lots of the firms that are mid-sized firms are born as mid-sized firms. They may not have 50 workers in year one, but by year two they will because they're just recruiting that first year. They're designed to be that kind of enterprise. And those kinds of enterprises are often the ones that grow and become larger. Now, who runs into the financial constraints? It is the mid-sized firm. I hear a sad story in Ethiopia when I did the book launch there. Um, I did a, uh, we did a special book launch just for guys from industry. And this guy stood up and he said, look, I'll tell you what it's like uh, trying to get finance. Um, he was running a building supplies company that make building materials. Very successful mid-sized business. And they wanted to move into a new product line making gypsum-based products. Now, Ethiopia, as you may know, has huge deposits of gypsum. This is comparative advantage squared. Uh, and this guy had a well-functioning company, and this was an obvious business opportunity. And he went around, and the banks turned him down. They said, how do we know Ethiopians would be able to make this? You know, we import this stuff. And that's a sad story. It doesn't of it always happen. But those mid-sized firms can run into constraints, and we do need to be imaginative about asking. These problems are more serious in Ethiopia than many other sub-Saharan African countries because of the approach they take to liberalization of capital markets and so on. But there can be constraints, and those constraints need to be addressed. But it's those mid-sized companies that we have to worry about. John, in Copenhagen in October last year, we had an aid and jobs conference, and you made that point about we need to think about who are actually the companies that are creating the most jobs. And when you sort of made it, there were a number of donor representatives who were sort of sitting there jumping in their seats. Are they wrong? No, I, I, I uh, you know, I'm a misunderstood person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spend my life having people quote back to me things I'm alleged to have said 10 years ago in some lecture. Um, I, I'm not against small companies. Small companies are really important. Uh, they employ an awful lot of people. Uh, in these countries that we're talking about, you've got to look after the small company sector. They're, they're a huge part of your population is employed in these. I'm not saying anything that cuts against that. But I'm saying, don't forget that it's a minority of people that are going to be your mid-sized companies. You're short of good, well-functioning mid-sized companies. That you've got to grow. Please look after the particular things that stop them in growing from being a 30-person <coughs> company to a 60-person company. But, but I'm entitled to worry about those guys without people thinking I'm putting down <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> but, but, but what do we do if the resources available are constrained? I mean... Okay, that's a very fair question. Um, but it comes back to questions implicit in this discussion of development banks. Um, is your, the question is, is your banking sector biased in some direction? Um, realistically, these guys, you should only lend them money if they have a really good commercial prospect, like my friend making gypsum products. A, a system that's not giving finance to him, that's a really malfunctioning system. I'm not saying they should take uh, bread out of the mouths of babes in order to give it to them. I'm just saying that you would expect in a well-functioning uh, financial system that a good business prospect for mid-sized companies should be financeable. That's all. Um, but uh, there I leave it. Sure. John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I couldn't pass up Peter's tempting question about the EPAs, because as most people in this room know, I thoroughly hate doing business. There's only one other international initiative I like less than doing business. That's the EPAs. Um, the EPAs point to a very important problem in the global aid architecture, or development architecture, if you will, which is that in a world of WTO rules about the protection of imports, and in a world in which most African countries are now uh, obliged under the EPA for their memberships to maintain an open trading system on the import side. One of the few measures of a bit of a leg up we can give to economies trying to get started in 
trying to break into the international market, is preferences. But then preferences really have to be combined with an aid strategy that supports the ability of these economies to respond to the preferences. And they actually can't be bait and switch mechanisms. And the EPAs, because they are inherently a product of the trade directorate in Brussels, have been set up with the objectives of trade negotiators in mind. And the trouble with trade negotiators is that the incentive structure for a trade negotiator is to get as much as you can for your side while giving as little as you can to the other side. So the EPAs, as they are currently structured, have highly restricted rules of origin, which do not encourage accumulation of value even across borders within the region. They're complex. Uh, they are far more beneficial to European investors, and in particular in the areas of such things as intellectual property rights and so forth, than they are to African manufacturers. And so the question really is, what has the development directorate been doing in Brussels? And the answer is it's been sitting on its hands or it's been smacked down, one of the two things. Now, to share the blame broadly, AGOA isn't much better. But the point is, if the US, if Europe, if Japan wants to get proactive in terms of thinking about African industrialization, one thing they could come up with is a consistent, reasonable, time-bound, and fairly liberal system of preferences. That's not rocket science. That's something that could be done, but it simply hasn't gotten on the agenda. Um, on the other hand, to show my neoclassical origins, Peter's second question about the cheap goods from China, I think represents one of these dilemmas as economists that we face. If we were certain that the cheap goods from China were dumping, then we could easily be against it. But if cheap goods from China are simply cheap goods from China, because China is better able to produce the products than competitors in the domestic economies in Africa, we are then taxing consumers for the benefit of industry. And there the real question is how much you believe people like Danny and people like me and others that there may be some externalities involved or some productivity benefits involved in industrializing and what degree of inefficiency you want to impose on your consumers in order to do that. Again, that's a cost-benefit calculation, but one of the purposes of a conference like this and the research that people have done is to try to get some bounds on that, to try to get some reasonable parameters on how much you should be prepared to sacrifice in order to get a head start, if you will, or a leg up. So I'm much more agnostic on the cheap goods from China issue simply because I don't believe we have the evidence base coming back to Tony's point today to really be definitive on that. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Carol, you have a, a point on the data. What have we learned over the last five years? <laughs> what have we learned over the last five years in data? So on, on the data point, um, I think that there's a, a two-pronged approach needed, in fact. Um, what you can see from the studies that we've presented over the last two days is that there's, a, there's some very good quality firm level microdata available in Africa that allows us to understand how firms evolve, how they grow, how they're impacted by foreign investment, you know, whether they export and why they export. And these kinds of data are incredibly valuable. So I would say that, you know, extending that, finding, um, you know, collecting these data, making sure we've got good panel data is, is, is a really important part of understanding the process. But there's huge value in the type of, um, type of data that, that, that John has been collecting as well um, through his, um, his, his, his country studies. Um, and in particular, if we're thinking about Africa developing um, in a different way to Asia and other countries, we've got to think about new ways of collecting data about understanding where the emerging sectors are. Case studies of, you know, for example, you know, green technology sector, you know, green energy, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we grow these sectors? We need to have specific examples. There's simply not enough quantitative data out there available or not enough firms available doing this kind of work to be able to, to gather it. So I would say we um, have some, the countries that we know most about in terms of learning to compete are the ones where we have the best quality micro data and firms, but we need more data. We need more data on, on um, service sector firms. We need more data on traded services. And we also need more data on these, these emerging sectors. 
one other point very quickly on the gender dimension because I, I can't resist. Um, I, do no, I did notice that there is a very notable gap in any discussion on gender um, over the last two days. And I think that the question of, of um, why um, micro-enterprises and, and female-run micro-enterprises don't tend to graduate to be small and medium-sized enterprises um, is, is something that, that needs further discussion. Um, I think this starts at a very high level in terms of um, political representation um, of women and also addressing um, social um, norms and cultures that um, prevent women from having equal economic opportunities is something that has got to be built into any future policy agenda. Thanks. Get, get your further questions ready, but Witness and Sam uh, have also indicated that they have a comment. Let me say on the end of agenda point that we are actually implementing a project on aid and gender, and gender is written into the 2014-18 work plan. So I just sort of wanted to highlight that, and assuming that our advisory board will approve that, we will be having uh, a strong focus on that in the coming years. So I just sort of wanted to make that point. Get your questions ready. Witness, you had a comment, and Sam, you also had uh, a briefly for it. Well, okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so for me, I think it's just a quick comment just to agree with, uh, with uh, uh, John uh, on, uh, on the issue of China, impact of China. I think, yeah. As long as there's no other evidence to the effect that there is, uh, it's unfair competition, I think there's very, it's very difficult to argue uh, against or to argue for any measures that would curtail, uh, if, as long as it's not, uh, I mean, what, what one needs is to get the information that, or the evidence that is actually unfair competition. Then, then of course, in that case, you can say, uh, you're actually disenfranchising uh, local or African producers, so it's unfair, then you can have uh, whether you want to do anti dumping duties or anything like that. Then, uh, then the other question that uh, the gentleman over there raised was uh, the issue of uh, the fact that the, the trading environment has become very constraining, um, which, which I think it's a, it's, it's a valid point that uh, there are so many uh, constraints, one of them being the EPA, and the others being, for example, WTO rules, which, which restrict uh, sort of measures that, uh, that uh, governments or policymakers can implement in their jurisdictions to try to support their, their firms. And I think it's sort of consistent with what uh, the panel has been talking to here in terms of um, maybe the kind of industrial policy that we have to see going forward is not the same as what we've seen before. So one, one has to be very strategic about it, and maybe you have to target, for example, this niche uh, sort of uh, product, and then you can support those uh, in a way that obviously has to be in conformity with the, 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 the agreed international rules. So, so yes, it's true that uh, the environment is quite constraining, but I, I don't think it does mean that there's nothing that can be done. Uh, I, I think one of the things that obviously could be done, for example, if you, if you look at regional, regional integration, and, and of course, uh, regional, sort of aligning the regional, uh, national and regional economic poli uh, industrial policies, I think that can also help to alleviate uh, some of these problems. Thanks. Okay, Sam, thank you, witness. Yes, Sam? Yeah, two quick comments. One on uh, data. Our experience with the uh, data is uh, uh, three challenges. One, uh, data is very much outdated. Industrial data, eight years old, 10 years old, six years old. This is an indication that the government may not be very keen to understand what's on the ground in order to act. But two, the content of that data you find very critical elements missing, which if they had included them in the questionnaire, you would have had the analysis much better. I think it's uh, the challenge of us, the researchers, to feedback to the uh, National Bureau of Statistics on how to improve the content. But third is the analysis itself. We analysts, there's so much data which is not analyzed. And sometimes we rush the field to collect new data when there is data in the National Bureau of Statistics which is not analyzed. So the three points I, I observe. But one quick point on uh, small firms. Um, uh, much as I agree that very few of them actually regrow into medium and large scale firms. But I think there are three other sources of dynamism um, with uh, very small firms, which in uh, the survey made in Tanzania, 97% of uh, enterprises were very, very small. Uh, we have seen the Productivity improvement in them compared to the people who came from agriculture to enter small enterprises. They have improved their productivity. But two, the productivity in the small firms is uh, operating under very difficult conditions in terms of uh, the policy environment. So enabling them to operate in a more friendly environment 
without uh, giving social uh, support, but simply making premises available for them and they'll pay, making credits available and they'll pay, can increase their productivity. Uh, and if the base is so large, the productivity gains can be large. But third, they can easily, uh, these, these would be the, the firms which can specialize through competition. They begin to specialize, much as small they are, but they begin to specialize. And some of them, a third point, they, with their experience, they move from uh, owners of enterprises to employees in larger technical firms. So I think there are many channels of dynamism of uh, small enterprises, not only uh, growing to large, but uh, they can be dynamic in our uh, economies. Okay. Yeah, so many channels of influence. What? To the question on inclusive growth in India. Unfortunately, I can't comment too much on India. My, my uh, family left uh, India three generations ago. But uh, uh, I, 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 what I want to say is, is I think that's a, a, a problem which is, which is well sort of captured. Uh, if one looks at the comparison of, of, of Nordic countries and, 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 and let's say uh, in countries that don't have the requisite uh, institutional uh, development, uh, then you get a kind of extractive uh, development path. And the danger is that that doesn't lead to broad-based development. So India may, may partly have that kind of uh, problem, but in, in, in many African countries, I think that the, the problem is that you have kind of extractive uh, capitalism because of its natural resource base. So, I, I, I mean, I think there the case is for, for deeper... Uh, and broader uh, institutional development, and part of part of that uh, challenge uh, can be addressed through developing uh, educational institutions that fit uh, the society, and that's a very important institutional uh, development that needs to be paid attention to. Okay, thanks, for it. I'm going to take two questions here, two here, and one over there in that row. Roger, you first, and then just behind you. Thank you very much. Roger Williamson, um, Institute of Development Studies. Uh, Fuad, I'd like to push you a bit further on that because um, on um, inclusive growth and job creation, um, are you worried about the Brazil example? Because uh, even in a country like Brazil, which has made real strides on industrialization and real efforts on social justice, you have an educated, underemployed, urbanized, discontented people. And it, so what do governments do? And I think, you know, in South Africa, you, you have some similarities because the government has made real efforts on social justice. And other members of the panel, um, is this a factor which concerns you? Because uh, if you educate people but don't give them jobs or don't provide jobs which actually fulfill them and give them a real uh, wage and real prospects of things getting better, you're educating people for discontentment. Yeah. Let, let, let's get a quick answer to that one, okay? Just a quick response. You, you, you're raising something that is a, a real source of con concern uh, because with that comes a very high level of uh, inequality as well. So uh, that's a potential threat in, in any society. Uh, and I think, yes, uh, in as much as uh, at uh, very many stages we look towards uh, Brazil as, as, uh, as a model, for developing inclusive uh, growth or growth with reducing inequality, which uh, uh, and, and South Africa does deliver to, some, to, to, to a large extent because we have one of the largest uh, social grants, uh, 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 welfare programs in the world. Uh, you know, so uh, the, the, the question is that if you're not going to create employment growth, uh, where, where Brazil has, has, has managed far better, uh, 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 that, that remains our key problem at the moment. And we're not going to generate that kind of growth with, uh, with the manufacturing uh, constraints that we face uh, at present. So we have to look at uh, the future with, with, with alternative areas and alternative sources of growth. 
Wider is very shortly publishing a study on inequality in Latin America. The conference in September will, to a very large extent, focus on inequality issues. So just to sort of draw attention, there was one question here, and then one here, and then John, and then I'm going to take one more, and then here, that was four. We take those four. Okay, good afternoon, my name is Nadia, I'm a PhD intern here at WIDER. Um, I wanted to link to the comment that John Page made before um, about tourism. Uh, I have been thinking a lot about tourism as an alternative to industrialization, actually. And I was wondering how you think that the protection of natural capital, which is so big and so important for Africa, should be a part of industrial policy, actually, considering that there might be in the future uh, an important comparative advantage deriving from the protection of natural capital, which is also important for livelihoods for many people in Africa. <clears throat> okay, here. Hello, uh, my name is Francis Mulangu um, uh, from the African Center for Economic Transformation. Uh, a lot of my work has been on this question of agro-processing. And uh, based on my observation, um, I've looked at, I've noticed that when it, when it comes to job creations, um, there's not much because they're, for them to be competitive, they have to be highly automated. Uh, when you look at the cocoa industry, for example, which um, I'm very familiar with, the one in Ghana, uh, in the 1990s, uh, two companies, 400 workers per company. Now, 11 companies, about 100. Uh, then you have this EPZ, where they don't pay taxes and they stay there for a long time. And if, my question is this, what, what is it to gain with uh, industrialization? Okay, strong question. What is there to gain, really? John? Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the, the, how disconnected Africa is in the product space, if we relate to the Hausmann Hidalgo. We haven't talked a lot about this. Uh, John Sutton, he touched upon it, uh, the importance of entrepreneurs being able to switch sectors when they fail in one sector. But where, if Africa is very disconnected in that product space, it's not that easy to move between different products. What should we do? Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, then this one. Thank you. My name is Sapar Chan from Cambodia. My question is a bit broad. Uh, I'm not sure how to put it. But uh, I think a lot of rich countries now are rich because of industrialization. I've, I've heard a few statements throughout the two days that no country can be rich without industrialization. Uh, so now it seems that we, re we recommend different countries to become industrialized. So my question whether, is whether it is possible to always have a positive sum on industrialization. I'm not sure if we ha can have a positive balance of payment or trade balance for every country so my view is that uh, it could be very challenging for every country to industrialize. Uh, it could depend on who would, be, who would do it first and at the expense of others. So I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Are we talking about global rebalancing in industrialization? If so, are we willing to aid the third world with technology? I wonder if ODA or foreign aid has a role in providing hardware technology to the third world uh, to catch up. Not okay. just uh, ODA in terms of you know, research and ideas, but really the startup capitals and technology, because that is badly needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One question here. Okay, over to the panel. Who wants to take the lead? Ernest? Yeah, thank you very much. Let me, let me uh, answer the question about uh, what is there to gain from industrialization. And uh, I think the, the, the examples uh, you chose uh, the, about the cocoa processing in Ghana uh, probably uh, mask the, the nature of the effort that needs to be made. So if you take a, an industry like the cocoa sector, yes, you need those large firms that would process for exports and go on to manufacture 
uh, chocolate. They produce, they, they provide employment for 400 people, which will go down depending on the type of technology they're using. But it's a whole big industry that has room for small scale operators also, who would have 20 employees, 30 employees, 40 employees, etc. So it's a matter of how do you process enough of your cocoa beans to provide jobs for several thousands of organic, and it's possible. So it's not, if you look at those two firms, you are likely to say, oh, after all the effort, after all the capital, that's all you have, 400 jobs. But think about the several uh, uh, women in Ghana who do make handmade chocolate with five employees and are exporting these, nicely packaged. If that industry were to grow and serve the Japanese market, for example, and there's a very high demand for beating Ghana chocolate in Japan. That's how these things happen. And uh, I link you to the last question about uh, everybody wants to industrialize. Uh, so how do you create large enough space for all of them through aid? Yes, there are 54 countries in Africa all seeking to industrialize. Some will industrialize before others. And those that come ahead of the pack will probably industrialize in a manner different from what the later uh, countries will do. There is, um, here I, I sort of have a, a different view in terms of the issue of uh, how Africa's industrialization will be. That it's not going to be like the Asian, it's not going to be like the American, it's going to be like European. But at the end of the day, industrialization means modernization. Industrialization means modernizing an economy using technology to produce things on a scale, a larger scale than before. And so in that respect, I don't believe that industrialization in Africa will be any different from where it, it's a matter of simply producing things on a scale cheaper than others. And that's, it's not African, it's not Asian, it's not European. It is the way the modern economy operates. There will be a specific country context. There will be an African context by way of the workers' attitudes. There will be an African context by way of uh, what goods are considered important. But it will not be an African industrialization. It will be industrialization. Thank you, Ernest. Danny, you are to leave in just five minutes. you have anything to say? Connected? Then let me thank you for coming. Um, and then when you sneak out, you're allowed to do that. With John, you had a comment? Yeah, I wanted to come back to this question of, of natural capital uh, and industrial policy. Um, we can get a bit too far afield, I think. Uh, I was just at a meeting for a couple of days in Yokohama along with <coughs> Professor Hosono, uh, with Joe Stiglitz, who these days is using the term industrial policy to cover such a wide range of things that one sometimes wonders where you draw the boundaries. But the point is absolutely germane, and that is that, one, our consciousness that there needs to be some sort of environmental accounting that begins to go into our thinking about economic development may actually create some opportunities for Africa. But two, in a field like tourism, this comes back to the role of the state, there's an obvious need for tourism strategies to reflect them on the sustainability of the resource and what kind of tourists you want, how many tourists you want, what kind of use of the resource you want. So that does become part of your sectoral policy, if you will. It should be coherent with your overall national environmental strategy, but I would argue that if your national environmental strategy is kind of caught and things are not moving, I'd rather see a much more aggressive move to bring that kind of thinking into the tourism strategy. And one of the things I think that has been difficult in Africa is that we haven't really had very systematic thinking on the part of national governments about how they want to see their tourism sector develop. And it's enormously important. If you look at Tunisia, for example, the Tunisians have fundamentally wasted their most precious resource, which is narrow, uh, relatively constrained beachfront land, by not having any strategy about how it should be used, or even worse, by having a strategy which is if you're a friend of Ben Ali's, you get a plot for a hotel. Now they're trying to undo that. Undoing that is a much more difficult thing than fixing it in the first place. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I think because tourism, for many countries in Africa, will be a very important sector, it's something where we really need to bring the environmental agenda and the industrial development agenda, industry largely written, 
together. Let me just reflect on Fuad's point. Um, I too worry, and I, I am optimistic like Benno, I am optimistic like John, I'm on record as having said there will be African leopards, but I do worry about an African spring. The fastest growing economies in Africa today are the economies that are generating the least employment per percentage of GDP growth. So we have masked that largely because people move into the informal sector. But these are not good jobs. And increasingly we're going to find, and if Ernest succeeds in improving the quality of education, uh, we will increasingly find frustrated young people constrained from entering into the kinds of positions that they aspire to and feel qualified for, um, and forced into other kinds of economic activity. And that can lead to a fairly difficult social situation as we've seen north of the Sahara. And the fundamental reality is that this is likely to get worse rather than better because as we see more natural resources discoveries, we come up against the fundamental reality that gas fields, oil wells, and gold mines don't generate very many jobs directly. So thinking that through and linking it to the development agenda, I think, has got to be part of what is the next generation of concerns for policymakers. Okay. Sam, you had a comment? That will then be the last one. Yes, one comment on uh, industrialization. I think there are two contradictory okay. lessons which I see in the history of industrialization. <clears throat> one, every country which came later adopted a different strategy because other countries had already come before it. So a late comer always adopted a different strategy of industrialization because the predecessor was already in place. But two, all countries share one common thing. They industrialized by building capabilities, by taking the opportunities which were available to them at that time, given the global economy, given the country conditions. So I would not be pessimistic thinking room is not there for industries. Room is there given the conditions at that time and the opportunities available at that time. But one thing is in common, accumulate capabilities on the lines which are available at that particular point in time. Okay, witness, you indicated you wanted. Just a quick, uh, so probably I'm abusing uh, the, the, the opportunity of giving no. me chair. <laughs> So, so I, I think in the, in the previous sort of round of questions, I, I didn't sort of come in, but uh, I think the issue of, uh, of, of finance is, is something that is quite interesting and quite relevant and topical in Africa. So, so obviously it's something that, uh, that is uh, ARC also, I think we are quite, quite keen on. And uh, so actually I just wanted to point out that uh, in our Decem upcoming December biannual, actually the theme there is uh, uh, financial inclusion and innovation. So it's, it's also trying to address that issue of uh, how do you sort of improve access to finance? Then, of course, the other thing that was also quite interesting and, and topical also in terms of the work that we do, is, is which I think is relevant to what has been discussed here, is the issue of um, uh, inequality growth and, and, and poverty reduction. So, so I, I think there is that issue that uh, growth hasn't translated into to poverty reduction, and obviously that's a source of concern, and, and it's something that, that I think uh, all policymakers would be worried about quite, quite a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, witness. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, these were 10 questions and 10 thorough sets of answers, comments, but there's of course still a lot of work to do, but it is now time to call this conference to a close. We have reached the conclusion. I very much hope you found it useful, fun, thought-provoking, um, and that you have met both old and new colleagues Thank you very much to the excellent panel members. This was great. Thank you very much to presenters, to chairs, and to all of you, those of you who asked excellent questions, got debates going. Make sure that they keep going. Development is also about exchanging. It's about sharing. Get the information, the knowledge out there. Let's address all of these difficult questions, and let's try and figure out whether we cannot come up with some helpful advice to policymakers who have to take decisions often in split seconds. Thank you very much.
to Anne. Thank you very much to the wider support staff. You have been there in the background. We have seen you, and we have noted that without you, this kind of conferences could not be done. Thank you also to the recording staff. You will be able to revisit our deliberations on the web. You will be able to download the slides and have a look. And also do check our angle, our newsletter, because there will be continuously stories, messages, news about what the wider global network is experiencing. There will be information about the next conference, and if you yourself can't come, well, maybe you have a colleague who can come. Look for that. In September, we will have the wider annual lecture given by President Adesari on inequality and social conflict. And then I have a question, or I have a request, or a plea, or whatever. In about a week's time, you're going to receive an email with an evaluation form. Can I please beg you to please fill it in? <laughs> when I'm sitting with the ones who pay for this and who are kindly paying, they really get upset when I cannot report back that we held a conference and that you felt this and that and the other about the conference. Can I please make that plea? I know I get these forms as well, and sometimes, yeah. Ah. Can I request that, please? We look forward to seeing you again, and I wish you a safe travel back home, and for many of you, back home where the real development challenges are facing us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year. Safe travel, and see you next time.